I was having a discussion with somebody the other day about, uh, it was about Ada. They were asking me some questions about what I do and uh, what I like about Ada, stuff like that. And wound up getting on the discussion a little bit about open source licenses and sort of why we're not okay with certain open source models. I got me thinking, I really haven't talked about that at all, and I think I should. And I also know I really should give a bit more direction about what I'm doing with the Ida Tools project. And the more I thought about them, both of these, the more I realized that they're actually a lot connected. So I'm going to be talking about both. First off, open source, what I think about different licensing models. Now, some of you at least, uh, follow me on the GitHub account that I've set up. You know that I'm definitely in favor of open source, generally speaking. I don't think it's right for everything. I don't think it's going to save the world, but I think it's pretty useful. But not for the reasons why a lot of people will say it's useful. For example, I disagree with the Free Software Foundation's attitude that it's important to have access to the code in everybody's hands. I just haven't really seen that as particularly beneficial. So there's something called Linus's law that really was never shown to be a law. As far as I've been able to find, there isn't actually any studies done for it. But it, it, the general idea is that the more people you have looking at code, the better it's going to be, the more people can fix it. And that should make sense, right? Until you get it all into some of the accountability problems and other things that open source is also experiencing. Yeah, it's a, it's a mess. I don't really want to get into trying to prove or disprove these kinds of things. I just want to mention that that's not my line of reasoning for why I like open source, but rather what I like about it is that because you have the source code and because compilers are increasingly getting really good at optimizing code, what we can do if the source code is available is to very specially compile code for each individual architecture. Now, uh, JIT sort of does this, especially if there's an uh, AOT uh, ahead of time uh, option along with it. Uh, Microsoft's been doing this a lot with their .NET, especially .Core for the uh, UWP platform. Actually, that might be a bit redundant, kind of like pin number, but uh, UWP does take advantage uh, AOT. So that is, you download a sort of pre-compiled form of it where some of the work is done but it's not exactly executable code yet. It's just ready to be run on the ugh, bug in the mouth on the virtual machine. And uh, the AOT steps in finishes compiling it, so you get much more native code performance. Which is a big reason why, if you've compared UWP with, uh, say, especially the old Silverlight stuff, it's pretty apparent which one performs better. That's not to say JIT isn't useful, 
but the startup times especially, ooh, virtual machines suffer pretty badly when it comes to that. And, uh, and that's sort of something that's driven me nuts about a lot of Linux systems. Not all of them, of course, though. Is that even though you have the source code available, you're often not building the stuff. And granted, some projects, LibreOffice especially, have absolutely horrible uh, build times that you would not want to rebuild them every single update. So, like, part of me gets why packaging is done, but there's still obvious performance benefits out of uh, compiling it for your specific architecture. Now, it used to, at least when I started learning Linux systems, you used to have to know exactly what target architecture you were using so you could tell GCC to optimize for it. A few years back now, God, actually probably like five years back now, uh, GCC got support for the MArch flag native target, in which case it would actually figure out what target you were really on and optimize for that. So I don't know, if you've gone through the Attitudes repo at all, you notice that in the compiler uh, interface, because I'm not actually writing a compiler, I'm still using NAT. Uh, it does reference both the MArch native and MTune generic flags. The idea behind this being sort of a best of both worlds option, where you can package a pre existing binary with the gene uh, generic tuning, but you still, because of the way NAT works, have the source available and can do a specific uh, native optimized build if that's what you actually want to do. That, that's really why I like open source. Being able to see what others are doing. <laughs> Oh, that's not pleasant. That's not pleasant at all. Nope. But being able to see how others are doing things, it's pretty cool. You can get that, even with closed source stuff, though, through patent applications. The uh, real beauty of open source, in my opinion, then, is actually what I described. That it allows you to do specific builds instead of like some Linux systems where they still build for the 80486 or 80586 targets, which is just disgustingly old at this point. And come on guys, we're we're way past that. Way past that. We need to stop building for that kind of shit. But they do. So, I guess I will actually delve a bit into some of my issues with some open source licenses and I guess actually explain why I use the licenses that I use. <clears throat> GPL, regardless of what some of its proponents say, is really anti-business. It's a... Uh, The GM GPL, which NAT uses, the NAT modified GPL, I think is a good compromise between the two, because I get what the GPL guys are trying to achieve. They want to make sure that the source code stays openly available. That even if somebody goes and forks the project and extends it, that they all, their contributions are still available even if they don't push those or make a pull request to the main repo. It's a fair point. I get it in theory. 
But, and as much as I disagree with the thinking in many regards, there are quite a few developers who like to keep a hold of their intellectual property. Now, I say I disagree with that idea because I'm pretty sure you can't really have intellectual property. You can't really steal somebody else's idea. You can just adopt their same idea. That somebody else using something that I've come up with doesn't take away the fact that I still have that idea and can do things with it. But that doesn't change the fact that there are a lot of people who do think that way and who probably wouldn't go and develop things without feeling like they're not going to be taken advantage of. I think that really the better option for, uh, for dealing with all the differences that people have in their thoughts and everything is something like the BSD license. Now, most of the source code I have up on GitHub is uh, two clause BSD, although I've, I've used the others. Uh, some of it's even public domain, and this is where we really get into how people don't really steal your shit. Not really. About a week ago now, an extension I developed for VS Code for providing much better, I think, IDA support in VS Code beat out the existing uh, extension for Ida. The code, code, it's a bunch of JSON formatting, is uh, public domain up on GitHub. Nobody's made a new extension. It's been up there for like five months now. It'd be totally legal for somebody to take that upload their own extension, claim they were the original author and everything else, be totally legal. And I wouldn't even be upset. I'd probably laugh at them and say they're a fucking idiot because there's no way they're going to compete with that. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'd be wrong. Well-funded business, maybe they'd be able to. But I know the language pretty well, and that's one reason why the extension does a good job of matching things and understanding the same keyword can be different in two different locations and things like that. You know, understanding the language better. But somebody be totally able to copy that work, claim they're originally the author, and nobody does. So, yeah, with that out of the way, I guess some of the direction I'm taking with IDA tools explain a bit more about why it's doing the different things that it does. Uh, I have some issues with IDA core. Uh, and it's complicated because they are absolutely the best provider of a IDA compiler. They're pretty much the only commercial entity providing any type of support for the language. I say pretty much because there are others like PTC, but they're really only focused on the defense industry and avionics. Aerospace, I guess I really should say, because it's not just avionics. And, uh, you know, there are some individuals, myself included, uh, as much as I butt head with the guys, Loot Guest definitely is doing, definitely deserves credit for his contributions to the ecosystem. There are others as well, like the Matreshka Library. I forget who the author of that is, though. But it really pales in comparison to what other, even newer, languages can offer. 
And that's where my beef lies. The things like, say, uh, dependency managers, uh, package managers, just, you know, sort of like package light managers or package manager light. I'm not sure what that would be. Um, but they're dependency managers. Uh, Nougat is a great example of that. I really like Nougat, but uh, there are there are others. What they do, for those unaware, is you declare your dependencies for your project, and if they're not installed on the system, the dependency manager pulls them in. So then, you're able to actually build the stuff, because, you know, that's important, or run the stuff, in the case of it just being a scripting language, where there isn't actually a build. And, uh... They're just useful, really. But it's not just a dependency manager that I think Ida really needs. There's a lot of other tooling that would be useful and just really isn't provided. Uh, an example, a unit lister. I've already got that working. Uh, that'd be similar to like a... I'm not actually sure what it's called. Damn it. But I know like when you open up Visual Studio or other major things. I have seen this with Java stuff as well. You can, inside of your package, um, project, I mean, sorry, you can get a list, not just of the files, but of all the actual classes and things like that inside of it. Now, in those types of languages, the class-based languages, a class can be spread across multiple files. This can, with a little trickery, actually be done with Ada, and there is a tool, NatChop, which takes advantage of this. Ada Tools doesn't work with NatChop yet. But I think it'd be really useful to have this. Now, it, Ada does have a almost one-to-one -one relationship with the units and the files. So, you go through the file list, you can see that, well, you know, if there's an ADS and an ADB file for something, and then you see its name, there's probably just that unit and a story. But, with the existence of uh, separate functions, separate procedures, and things like that, or even just what NatChop does, It'd be useful to have. But there are also more useful features. And in a similar vein, since classes are sort of like Ada packages, but sort of like Ada types, and it'd be useful to have a type browser. That isn't entirely working yet. Uh, a lot of the simpler types are, but not the more complicated ones. That kind of thing. Nat sort of provides with Nat find, but it really just does these sort of regex based searches that you could pretty much accomplish with said or find anyways. Or, sorry, not said, uh, grep. Said something else. How this is different is that it's actually going through and finding where the types were declared, including multiple declarations of the same type. Now, that may sound a little awkward, like some kind of syntax error. Oh, the name's colliding or something, but if you want to have a private implementation of a uh, type, you can actually do that in Ida or it's publicly available, but you can't really get any information out of it, you can just use it. That's a thing. So you have the exact same type 
declared in numerous locations within the same package. NatFind gives some weird output, at least the last time I used it, when uh, you, you try to find the type using it. Ida Tools does correctly handle this for the types it recognizes right now. Furthermore, this kind of thing is also useful for the generation of the export library with PECOFs, which, for those unaware, are what DLLs are under the hood. The actual library format is known as PECOF. Uh, sort of a pain in the ass to have to deal with those because ELFs you don't have to do anything with. And those are the shared objects on basically every Unix system. I say basically because OSX is probably the most popular one that doesn't actually use ELFs. They use MacOS. And uh, ELFs you don't really have to do anything for. You just build. Now the export uh, libraries do have some benefits. I'm not really sure if they're justified though. But being able to automatically recognize types and whether or not they're publicly accessible or not is definitely an important part of automatically generating those uh, export libraries. This same kind of thing needs to be done with uh, recognizing functions and procedures. Operators basically just being a special case of functions. Now, most of that I've described is really just browsing and some package management stuff. For the most part, that's really all I intend data tools to be. Uh, you know, sort of project assistance. But that's not to say that's the only reason why I'm doing all this work. If you've looked at the repo at all, you can tell that Ida Tools is really a library. There's a separate pro uh, separate project within the solution that is a command line interface for it, but it doesn't do a whole lot of processing. It just calls the stuff from the library and then prints it out. The uh, Hopefully, the Ida Tools library will be useful to other people. Because the similar attempts by Adicore kind of run into some problems. They have their Langkit library, and then the libadalang library, which is built upon the Langkit library. But at least as far as I was able to find, can't seem to find a license on their GitHub pages. Now, that's not okay. It's also not particularly well documented. Uh, although maybe they're using like a documentation generation tool that you have to download the repo and then run the generator inside. But if they are, those kinds of things like Doxygen and similar usually use these special document uh, comments. I couldn't find a whole lot of them. Maybe they didn't feel certain things needed to be documented because they were largely private to the thing, but I, I don't like that. I know I've showed off the code, parts of the code, quite a few times now, and you can really tell that things are documented way up even to the point of me documenting most enumerations and even what the individual values in the enums are. So, and I take documentation pretty seriously. Because if you're providing a library, the idea is you want other people to use it. And if it's not well documented, it's hard to figure out how to use it. 
But I know with the seemingly non-existent license, maybe I've missed it. If I missed it, just please point out where it actually is, but it's not obvious. Um, but the seemingly non-existent license makes it hard to know if you even can. Because at least in most countries, definitely including the U.S., where Idacore is based out of, if there's no license, you're supposed to assume that it's all right reserved. Which case, even though it would be open source, it's not free software. Now, I, I doubt Idacore meant to do this. They do seem to be proponents of free software. They license almost everything under the GPL, so maybe... Maybe they just gave it some strange name, because... Lord knows, Free Software Foundation loves to be obscure as shit. So, maybe, maybe the license for the project is just in some weird location. And that it is GPL licensed. I don't know. But just the fact that it's not even in like a standard license file or included as a comment on top of the sources just makes it hard to figure out if you even can use it. That's not okay in my opinion. The other thing, and I, I think this is just more of a technical matter, um, I will say absolutely, libidolang is the more powerful of the two options. Because libadalang actually understands the semantics. By that I mean it's a full blown parser, it generates a parse tree, everything else. Note that you don't necessarily need to develop a parse tree, there are other ways of doing this, but that's what it does. And that provides a much, really much more in-depth analysis of the language. Whereas Editools is really just a scanner, just literally a really detailed scanner. And uh, that's all it does. Just scans for certain patterns. Doesn't really care if they're valid or not. As long as it pretty much matches, it's good. This is because I'm not trying to use it as a compiler or any type of language analysis in any depth. Because Nat already does that. It's basically just project assistance. So it doesn't need to have a detailed understanding of like what this type is or whether the type's even in the right place just needs to go, oh hey, this is a type. I'll record it. Uh, this does mean that Ida Tools, in theory, is a bit lighter weight. You'd really need to run some profilers on that to be sure, but considering a huge part of the Langkit framework is Python. I'm willing to I'm willing to bet once I get a real release, Ida Tools will be more lightweight, just because it's not trying to do as much. Note that that should not be confused with being the better product. Just that uh, they have different goals. Just trying to get some information out of a unit. I had a tools is fine. Trying to hook into something for syntax highlighting or for code metrics. I had a tools isn't going to help you out at all. So some of what I've been working on with the library recently, uh, since the last time I showed it off, 
a lot of under the hood stuff there when I last showed it off and literally everything before that uh, what the actual parsers would do is gather up literally every single thing about the unit regardless of whether they were needed or not now obviously that's not a great solution I'm sure there's plenty of functional programmers out there who are going dude no and right one of the better ideas that functional programmers really stress is on lazy loading. Now, you actually don't want to lazy load everything or lazy evaluate everything, but this is definitely one of those situations where parsing slow. You don't want to do that unless you absolutely need to. So if the only thing you're doing is generating a table of the units within the project, why parse the configuration file? Why parse all of the types within all the units? And eventually, parse all of the functions and procedures within a unit. That's a lot of extra work that isn't going to be printed out. You don't need it. What... Uh, What I got going, the lazy loading of those. So this isn't actually done with the lazy class. Uh, and the reason for that is if I were to turn a lazy of the different types that uh, the units can return, like a, or the project can return, like a units collection or a types collection or whatever, the downstream dev would actually need to call the dot value property of it and cause it to actually load. It's sort of awkward. So what I do instead is basically recreate that lazy type. Uh, it's not actually that much work. Uh, generic lazy type is, but doing the lazy loading isn't actually that much work. What happens when you call the property the very first time is it actually parses that. And then once it has the full thing that it's supposed to return, saves it and then returns it. Next time you call that property, it just straight up returns it because it already knows it has the stuff. This way, you return and the actual type and not wrapped up in a lazy. So it's a little bit cleaner to use, but it's still lazy loaded. And like I said, it really wasn't that much work. The property getter should never need to be modified, ever. Um, there are a few other under the hood changes. A few lists got changed to hash sets uh, where I could. Some things seem to need to stay lists. Uh, we'll see if I can change them to hash sets or something similar. Um, reason why that's an actual improvement is that if you're doing something that's really lookup heavy, it's quicker to look up in a hash set. Hash set basically just being a hash table. <laughs> Whereas with a list, um, I'm not sure how the .NET Core lists are actually implemented. Uh, I don't think they're a doubly linked list. They are definitely presented as if they are. I think they're a tree. Don't hold me to that, though. I'd be really curious if anybody has some detailed information on that. Uh, probably look it up in the .NET Core runtime, actually. But those, the types in unit collection, which are implemented with lists right now, probably should be changed to use a hash set as well. Uh, I just wasn't able to get it working quickly, uh, but I'll think around with that because that, again, those those collections are considerably more lookup heavy than anything else. You don't remove anything from them, uh, so it's just add and lookup. Hash sets are definitely the better thing to use there. But the other big thing I've been doing is changing the uh, source class 
what that originally was, this is just a really long string. When you opened a file, it was read into that, literally line by line, into one really large string. And then all the parse operations on top of it. It worked. It's obviously not good. Has no understanding of the different parts of the source. And you wind up with the list problem all over again. Because it's one really long string, you have to read from beginning to end every single time. It's not good. I'm debating between two possible options. The first I'm doing is to break it up into separate strings where the different parts of the source code are placed inside. This isn't a huge uh, improvement, but it does allow scanning certain things to be quicker. For example, if you're only interested in what the dependencies of a project are, it's much quicker to, if you have the little bit of include space above the unit, marked separately, so that you know that an include declaration, whether it's a with or a use, should only be in that. We well, only need to scan that now. You don't need to scan the entire source file. It's speed up. It doesn't help as much when you're doing things that would be inside the unit itself, but it's still a speed up. Another thing I'm considering though is to still keep it in one really long string, or maybe actually an array of strings. See, because the way it was before was an uh, array of strings delimited by new lines. It wouldn't be that hard to change that to, uh, or sorry, a single string with each line delimited by new line. It would not be hard to change that to a, uh, an array of strings, where instead of delimiting, each line is one of the strings inside the array. Then you could just have a reference to the start and end of each section. That might be the way I go. I'm not certain yet, but that might be the way I go. Then you still get the same benefit of being able to scan only the right area. But it'd be a little less friendly for people to contribute to that way. And I'm not sure if there's any performance differences between the two options. So I'd have to profile it. Either way though, both approaches accomplish the same idea of breaking the source into multiple parts where you can scan the smaller area of where it should actually be. This would also be important for actually saying whether or not types are publicly or privately accessible, or whether they're, say, publicly accessible, or visible, I mean, publicly or privately visible, or also the case where it's publicly accessible, but you can't actually view the type. So that is, it's the full declarations in the private part, but it's still publicly accessible. Can't tell that just yet. We'll be able to, but it doesn't yet. Um, aside from that, there is a library type now, which collects all the units similar to the project class. But the library instead is a static class that collects for the library. All the installed units get registered with that. And the reason for this is because somebody really could go on and develop, say, like a build server or whatever, that could handle multiple projects and whatever. But you don't want each project to have to load up the installed units all over again. That's just a huge pain in the ass. It's not a good way to do things. 
So it's better if they're all collected together in one common location and just registered with it. Any project that registers a library, you get a new project that comes down the line later. It needs that same dependency. It's already registered. You already have all the information about it. Not so much an, op uh, an optimization for the uh, command line project, because that's a one-shot. Works on one project, that's the end of it. But it is an optimization for more sophisticated things. And it needed to be implemented anyways. Something needed to register the already installed units. So, I was just thinking down the line, instead of registering them with the project or whatever, it makes sense to register them in one common place. Uh, that is mostly working already. There are a few parse errors that are stopping me from registering the entire IDA standard library, at least libnat. I don't actually have access to any of the other ones to test that with. I'd like to. I just don't have access. But um, I will get that working because that's obviously important but that's definitely a good really good test for IDA tools being able to uh, parse the entire IDA standard library because the free software foundations and IDA cores uh, style is a bit different from mine so if it can properly handle somebody else's style that's a pretty good indicator that the parsers are working correctly. So, yeah, un unfortunately with the next video there probably won't be much to show off because these are a lot of under the hood improvements. There really isn't a whole lot to show off of them. Um, they matter a lot for performance reasons or usability reasons and things like that. Um, but they're definitely library level under the hood improvements, not so much features. I nearly forgot uh, one thing to mention about dependency managers and how they're really catching on and why I think Idacore really, really jumped the train on that one. Even languages like C and C++ are getting package manager or dependency managers. I try not to call them package managers because the system admin in me is just knows them as something else. But uh, I think it's Conan or something like that for C++. But there's also uh, something from Microsoft. I'll get the link for it. Uh, but Microsoft wrote a uh, dependency manager for C++ as well. Honestly, I don't know why they didn't reuse Nougat. Um, it's probably some technical issue. But considering Nougat has been modified with Chocolatey to actually do install packages, I figure they probably could have just reused Nougat. But, you know, there is actually a a dependency ma two dependency managers for C++, probably even more, just those two that I'm aware of, and I'm not even really a C++ dev. So, there's clearly an interest in these things, and the closest thing IDACore has got going on to that is the GPR tool suite. Now, NAT install, or GPR install, sorry, only does from local projects that you've already built. And installs them in a weird way. I don't really agree with it. And I think the ins pretty good proof the installer is broken as shit is that when you need to update XML IDA, you usually have to uninstall the entire thing. And everything that XML IDA depends on reinstall XML IDA and then reinstall 
everything else. It's not so much of an issue for you guys who use the Editorial Editor toolchain, but if you use the Free Software Foundation's uh, version because of licensing nonsense with Editor, you uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's not okay in my opinion. It's a it's a broken installer in my opinion. But uh, it doesn't really do anything to help you out when those dependencies aren't already on the system. It just complains that, hey, you know, I couldn't find this project, but it doesn't provide any kind of assistance for downloading them. You know, it doesn't do anything like .NET Restore, where it pulls in all the dependencies and says, okay, you're good to go now. It just yells at you. It was very, very 90s. Come on, guys. And, uh... I really don't think that's okay. Especially for... Cause, I mean, I think a lot of you guys need to, to remember that... We're all newbies once. And I think it's because of the way I wound up learning. You know, I didn't have a really nice formal education with everything handed to me. Learning at it was fucking terrible. I and mean, it's a good language. I'm glad I, I stuck with it, but it's terrible. The community around Ida is basically non-existent. The tooling's terrible and everything else. And it was, without any doubt, the hardest language to learn. That's not okay. I care about the language. I, I hope that's obvious. I know it, it's at least obvious to a few people. And uh, I'm trying to actually do something about it by looking back at how bad my own experience was and provide those things that really should have been there. When you're, when you're not just learning the language, but also have to learn how to install dependencies and where to even find them and all that crap, that's, that considerably worsens the learning curve. That's how you get people giving up and going to learn other things instead, not coming back to it. That's not okay. So, yeah, trying to, that's a huge part of the, the Added Tools project, is trying to provide all those things to make it as easy as possible to develop in Ida. So things like the automatic project configuration, where I can you know, figure out what's a unit, what's a program, build them appropriately, figure out the right build order, stuff like that. I mean, you can kind of do that with a uh, NAT and then a glob for all the ADA sources in a project, but um, the difference is that I'm actually working on adding stuff to pull in the dependencies. You know, kind of like with uh, .NET Core 2.0 and 2.1, where it automatically calls .NET Restore if it needs to. Doing that kind of thing. Uh, my, my intention is to look through the system first, see if those dependencies are there, and then uh, link them over. This is because you can't... You kind of can't reuse the NAT search path. It, there's this weird issue, and I've talked about it with other videos, but it, it, the whole thing sort of breaks down if you already have the thing you're building installed, which is often the case when you're developing. So we run back again to those issues with 
just developer unfriendliness. That's not okay. Yeah, so... Sort of hijacking the build system there. Hide the search path so Nat doesn't see the system, and then knowing the search path otherwise, uh, link in the appropriate things. Uh, but then if they're not in the system, actually try to fetch them. I'm not entirely sure how I want to do that yet. Uh, I've been thinking torrents would actually be a really neat idea. Uh, you can use a tracker to have an actual registered list uh, so that you have, you know, an actual package repo page where you can register or site that you can register with and browse the packages and everything else. Um, but then when it comes down to the actual download, you use torrents. Because that automatically provides the uh, checksumming and validation. Automatically provides the distribution method. Because even if nobody else seeds, I still have wherever I have the packages up uh, seeding the torrents. Well, nobody else contributes. I still have a viable server just from that alone. That kind of thing, pretty useful in business settings, though, where you can have, uh, you know, you need to update, say, 500 machines. Uh, it's much quicker if they can start seeding between each other. That's, I mean, one of the reasons why torrents were developed. They're not just popular among pirates. Hopefully I remember to edit it in here, but uh, starting with Windows 10, I think, I didn't see it before. Microsoft is actually has a setting you can turn on to help seed updates to other people. I'm not sure if they're using torrents exactly, or some custom protocol or something, but they're definitely, you know, utilizing that idea, recognizing that it's a good way to help... Uh, not just lighten the load on them, but help people actually get the stuff faster. But, yeah, I'm probably going to do torrents, just because they provide so much, pretty much out of the box, and there's... wouldn't be that hard to get it working. Another issue I have with Idacore, I was browsing their blog the other day, and I think it was their blog anyways. And uh, I think this is pretty much the perfect example of how sort of unaware their management or something is. They actually spent time and resources and everything else developing a font with special ligatures for IDA programming. And I know at first, some of you are like, hey, 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 but there are things like Fira code and uh, Monoid, and there, there are some others that do that. And they're actually really nice. I know because I use Fira code. I'm not talking quite like that, though. I'm not talking about taking the you know, operators with two or three symbols right next to each other and joining them into one single symbol that look better. No, I didn't do that. Their ligatures were taking things like begin and end and replacing them with curly brackets. I wish I was kidding. Because at that point, you might as well just use Rust. Rust has cargo and other things that make it more pleasant to develop in. But seriously, that was something somebody honestly thought was a good idea to spend money on, spend time on, to help people move to Ida. You fucking serious? People need something that will actually make development easier. Not make it look like a different language entirely. But come on, guys.